and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. I'd like to welcome those who are watching this TV program to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that God chose the foolishness of preaching or preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who believe. In James chapter 1, if you'll take your Bibles and open up there. Verse 17. The Bible says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That has an opposite, opposite side to that. Every evil um, gift and every wicked gift comes up from below. From the devil. And that's true. That statement may not be used a lot, but that's a true statement. Only good and perfect gifts comes down from the Father in heaven. That's all he gives us. Uh, it may not, not look that way to you and I. And what when we ask God for things, when we tell God we need this and we need that, and then he gives it is that that which we need it may not be just exactly what it was we were asking for but if God gives it to you it's going to be the best thing for you God always gives us what we need he always gives us his best and he never gives us anything that will hurt us what God gives us not only sustains us in this life but it will help us get to the next life with him on the other hand, the devil doesn't want us to get there. You know, the devil, he's alive and well. You know, more people believe in, Jesus, in Santa Claus than they do the devil. You know, Santa Claus has talked a whole lot more, especially during the Christmas season. You know, you go ask a little kid about Santa Claus, and, you know, Santa Claus is, he's the person that they want to talk about. But why? Because he brings toys. All oh, so they have been taught. That Santa brings toys. So they make a big deal out of it. But we don't talk a lot about Satan, the old devil. Now we know at times when the storms of life comes our way, when things don't go right, when we're in pain or there's sickness or we lose a loved one they're sorrow about, well then we want to blame the old devil. And rightly so. Because he is the one who invented and brought about death and sin. And he challenged and proposed it to Adam and Eve in the garden in the beginning. And they fell, they fell for, it, for it. Excuse me. The old devil doesn't want us to get to heaven. He didn't want to have us have every good and perfect gift. When it says good and perfect gift, it means it's always good for us. It's always beneficial for us. It will always help us get through this life and get into the next. Now Satan, he'll give us gifts and it, they'll look good too, okay? He can make it to where you can have lots of money if, you, if, he, if that's where you want to go. He'll make it to, he can make it that way. Nice automobiles, nice houses and what have you. Satan can make it to where you can have that. But you'll have to choose to follow him to do that, you see. On the other hand, it's not all the time that when you're serving the Almighty God that you're going to have nice cars and nice houses, okay? You're not going to have a lot of money a lot of times. And, and you know, I, I, I can verify that. But that doesn't mean I don't have God with me. That doesn't mean I'm not going to heaven. We have an adversary. If you turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5. You know, we like, we like to call that uh, 
leader over there in North Korea, our enemy. And we like to call those people over in Iran, our enemy. And so they may be. But we have a chief enemy, and that's the devil. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. How many times do we get told this and warned? How many times is this brought to our attention? To be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We don't get that much, do we? You know, the preacher might say, you might read it in the Bible once in a while. Uh, it might be brought up once in a while during Bible study. But other than that, that statement is left alone. And yet we wonder why uh, all the evil things take place, you know, that are around us and all the wicked things, why people do the things that they do. And I tell you, it blows our mind away that some of the things that people can do today blows our mind away. But we wonder why. And we try to blame it on other things. And I'm sure that, uh, that there are people who are guilty or involved in it just as, as much as Satan is. But we like to blame other things. And sometimes, wake up, Joanne. Sometimes we don't blame Satan at all. You know, sometimes we don't even mention his name. But we mention a lot of other people's names, okay? You know, I, I can mention a lot of names, you know, like Hillary Clinton. And, and uh, what's that other guy's name? He's, he's, he's black. What's his name? Obama. Obama. And, you know, there, there's a whole host of people I can blame for things happening. Uh, what about on the state level? There's people I can blame for things happening. What about in the home? Yeah, I've got faults. There's things that I could be blamed for. And so could you. But how much do we blame Satan? I mean, how much do we say his name? How much do we get on him? about the evil that's taking place. Well, the Bible says that he's like a roaring lion. He's our adversary. He's walking to and fro on the earth, seeking out people who he can devour. We know what lions do to their dinner. Get in between those strong jaws and those teeth and devour it. Now, we're talking about that they can eat up uh, zebras. And they can eat up horses and, and things of that nature those strong jaws and those teeth, and devours them. Well, that's what we are, Christians, in the eyes of Satan. He's the roaring lion. We're his dinner. And he wants to devour us. And he does a good job sometimes, doesn't he? Yeah, sometimes we let him win, don't we? But see, that's why we have the written word of God. That's why God instructs us so that we'll, that will not happen. If you would, take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew's kind of the gospel in chapter 4. We've got to remember some things here. <clears throat> I'll use us first. Let's say every one of us went without food for three days. Morning, noon, and night for three days. We'd be in pretty bad shape, wouldn't we? Yeah, if we went three days, yeah, we'd be shaken. You know, our bodies would be acting up. There would be other sickness that would come along on account of that. We'd be shaken. We wouldn't be in very good shape, okay? Uh, I don't know, after three days without food, I don't know if I could go to work or not. Just be honest with you. But what about Jesus? You know, we understand going without food for a little while, what it does for us. But what about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4? I want to start with uh, Matthew chapter 3 in verse 13 first. We must understand that when we read things in the Bible, it's all God's plan. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Every scripture from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to Revelation chapter 22 in the last verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And because of that, they all 
are in order as God laid it out. All the timing is in order as God laid it out. And we can't understand that. Okay? We can't understand that. How God could be so exact in His timing. The things that happened happened in God's timing and not ours. In uh, Matthew chapter 3 and starting with verse 13, this is simply another place where God's plan is unfolding. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. You see, this was part of what God sent his son Jesus to come and do. Okay? This wasn't according to any man's law. This was something God sent Jesus to do as well as to heal the sick and cause the blind to see and, and what have you. Uh, go to the temple uh, on the, 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 the Passover day with the family and, and sit in the temple and, and uh, talk with the chief priests and, and those people. Uh, all the things that Jesus did, He did because He asked the Father what He wanted Him to do. And the Father told Him. Everything that Jesus did, He never did on His own. He always got permission from the Father. Instruction from the Father. And this is one of those things in verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John, John the baptizer, to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. You see, John, whether he knew it or not, was trying to change God's unfolding plan. Okay? By his saying that I'm not worthy to baptize them. And he wasn't. But it was God's plan that John would baptize Jesus. And Jesus answered, said unto him, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. It was God's plan that Jesus go to John the baptizer. Why didn't he go to any others? Go to John the baptizer, and he said to become with us. It wasn't just Jesus. It's both him and John to fulfill all righteousness. It was part of God's plan. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. Jesus set the example for baptism, going down to the water and coming up out of the water. Jesus set the example of the Holy Spirit. After baptism, the Holy Spirit was over, over top of Jesus, descending like a dove. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God was pleased with Jesus. Why? Because he did exactly as he told him to do. Okay? What about you and I? When we repent of our sins and we get into the water grave baptism, you know, our sins are washed away. We're baptized. We went down into the water. Then we will come up out of the water. Coming up out of that water, guess what? We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, my friends. And guess what? God says, this is my beloved son in whom, or my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because we, he did, we did what he told us to do. That's why. Wake up, Joanne. Also, after Jesus was baptized, like you and I, when we come to that water grave of baptism, Satan begins to attack. Okay? Every person that comes out of that water grave of baptism, Satan knows that he has to attack to get you back away from God. And so he begins attacking. Now, it may not be great things that happen to you right off the bat. It might be little things, things that you don't notice. But he's there to attack, to get you away from God. And so when Jesus come up out of the water, it was God's plan that he be led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Jesus was going to set the example for the church. Okay? Not the world, but the church, the Christian. 
And so, then was Jesus led the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And we had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was afterward and hungered. We can kind of relate to that, can't we? You know, we go without food for a little while. We get hungry. We start tasting food, even though it ain't in our mouth yet, because we know what it tastes like, our favorite food. And if we go longer, we have an even a greater desire for it. We become dangerous, you know, like if someone's standing in our way, we might kind of push them out of the way to get to it. And if we still go without food, we might start getting weak and sickly and shake. And our thought process begins to change. It's not as good as it once was. Then we start making bad decisions. Like, I don't know if I want to go to work now or not. You see, especially if you're a family man, you have a family. Start making bad decisions. How do you think it was for Jesus? He's all God and all man at the same time. Jesus is God. God is a spirit and God took on the form of a man in Jesus. You see, the Bible says so. And he is tempted in every way like you and I were, are. Yet he did it without sin. Jesus suffered in every way that you and I suffer. Tempted in every way that you and I are tempted. Jesus lived as a man for 30 some years on this earth. Okay? He lived as a man like you and I. He had to go to the bathroom. He got thirsty. He got drink. He had to eat. He had to sleep when he got tired. <laughs> okay? What do you think it was after 40 days and 40 nights of that food? Do you think Jesus was still as strong as he was the first day? Do you think that he was someone when you looked at him that you really ought to fear him? No. I bet you Jesus was one who was about to faint. I bet his body, because it was physical, was having all the same things that would happen to you and me, our physical bodies. And yet, in his most weakest time, that's when Satan attacked. Okay, God knew that. God didn't have to have Jesus go and go without food for 40 days, 4 nights, and get Satan attack him. He wanted to do it right. He wanted us to be able to look and read about it and see that Jesus overcame. Even at his weakest point, he overcame. Get back where I was here. Verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. The old devil came to Jesus and talked to him and tempted him. If you be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. See, Satan knew that he, was, he, was, he wanted some food to eat. Okay, He knew it. So he take these stones and said, here's food. Turn them into bread and eat. Take care of your hunger. But as bad a shape as Jesus was in, what did he use to defeat the devil with? The Bible. The Word of God. He said, It is written, Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Yes, we need food to eat, live physically. But we don't need just food. We as Christians, God's people, we need the food of the Word of God to live. You will not live eternally if you do not eat this food. You will die spiritually. Okay? When you allow yourself to get to the weakest point because... Now listen up, folks. If you're not studying every day, if you're not eating of the spiritual food every day, you're getting hungrier for it and hungrier for it. And it will come to the point where you're starving yourself of the spiritual food, the Word of God. And as Jesus was, so will you and I be. Satan will catch us at our weakest point. 
and He will come and tempt us. Will our answer be to Him as was Jesus? You have to understand. Jesus lived to teach God's Word. Jesus was full of God's Word. He was full of the spiritual food. Okay, Jesus would not allow Himself not to be because He knew if He did that He would lose the battle with Satan. And then God would have to intervene. In other words, God would have to go outside His plan in order to do it. What about you and I? When it comes to eating the spiritual food, when we're tempted by Satan, do we use the Word of God to defeat him? Or do we run from him? We allow him to defeat us. That's what happens. You know, you can't sit, we can't fight Satan without the Word of God. And the only thing you can do is either let him defeat you or run from him. And you're going to be running all your life. Jesus said it is written. I'm telling you, there's power in the Word. When we're Satan by the, uh, tempted by the devil, we need to use the Word of God on him. And it will defeat him. This is the tool, the sword of God, that God gives us to defeat Satan with. This can and will defeat Satan. Nothing else will. Now think about that. Nothing else will defeat Satan except God and His Word. He went on to say, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What do we call this? The Bible? What else? The Word of God. Like, I'm talking right now, okay? It, it, you know, if I tell you that I worked yesterday, that's the Word of day, isn't it? Well, this is the Word of God. And Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Bible is every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The devil couldn't win on that one, so he tries again. Verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, uh-oh, now Satan's using the Bible. He knows the Bible. He's, he, he liked what Jesus did, defeating him with the Word. Now he's going to try it on Jesus, using the Word. For it is written, he shall give angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Again, Jesus was not going to allow Satan to trick him. Now we have to understand, Jesus is still in that sickly mode. He hasn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. He's weak. And he's still, because of his closeness, because of his love for God and his word, he still could defeat Satan by saying, it is written in verse 7, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus spoke those words and he defeated Satan. Satan couldn't win. He had to try something else. In verse 8, And again, the devil taketh him up into exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Satan knew that he had to give the very best that he could. He had to give all that he could. And so what will it be? All the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. He offered that and he could. Because why? Satan is the prince and power there. Satan is the god of this lost world. Okay? So he could do that. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Three times Jesus said, It is written. 
and defeated Satan three times. The question would be, have you and I been tempted in this way in any, in, at any time? We haven't. We haven't been tempted like Jesus was. But do we use the word of God to overcome the devil? Or do we let all the devil have his way and we run and keep running? You know, the devil don't show himself as he really is. If he did, everybody would run from him. Everybody would. Everybody would run from him. But because we can't see him with our naked eye as he really is, we don't run from him, okay? Or we don't run fast enough. Or we don't do use the word of God sometimes to overcome him. And we, let, and we let him have his way. Jesus didn't do that. Verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. You know, God was involved in all this. This was God's plan that Jesus go through this. To set the example for you and me. You see, when we're tempted today, we're to use the written word of God to overcome the devil. And we will defeat him. When the, self, when the devil gets to us to the point that we're weak, we're still using the word of God on him, he'll leave. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He'll leave for a little while. The Bible says, angels came down and ministered unto Jesus. Now, I don't know if we'll ever see him with the naked eye, but we have angels too, okay? All the angels of heaven are on our side. And they will minister unto us if we'll do what, excuse me, do what God says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, if you'll turn over there, please. Satan is sly. He is trickery. And we don't give him the credit due him as far as being as good as what he does. Satan can get in our lives if we open up the door just a little bit. You see? He can't bother us if we don't want him to. Satan or nobody can harm us unless, unless we let him. And you know, if, if, we, if we do something to allow Satan to just get a little foothold in the door, well then he'll come in all the way. You see, and he'll start affecting our lives. And that's why we have the Word of God to tell us that these things happen and how we can deal with it. Like I said when I began, Santa Claus has talked more than Satan is. You know, when we get older, you know, we don't want to discourage children and say, well, there is no Santa Claus. But certainly we as adults should not believe that there is a Santa Claus, not like we're proclaiming on Christmas Day. Okay? And at the same time, as adults, you know, children don't believe in the devil. You know, as far as they believe, the devil is cartoons or a little red man, little red man with a pitchfork, you see. But yet, Santa Claus means a whole lot to them. But when we get older, it ought to be the other way around. <laughs> Okay, we should not believe so much in Santa Claus, but we ought to believe that the devil is real. And he's after us. Well, Paul dealt with that a little bit. Now, I won't go through all the ways that we allow Satan to creep in. But I'm going to deal with one way this morning, how we allow Satan to creep in. And <clears throat> we're all guilty of it at times, okay? We're all guilty of it. We heard Tom talking about on Wednesday nights that the songs that we sing, you know, if they're not scriptural songs, when well, they're not honoring Christ. And that's a way to let the devil to creep in when we use unscriptural songs. Let's, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 12. 
Paul said, But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. There were men who were claiming to be apostles and prophets. But they were teaching something different. And Paul was set to the defense of the gospel. Okay? And he was to set to defend the gospel from these people. And they didn't want, uh, especially you know, the church there at Corinth, to look at these people as some great ones from God. So Paul goes on to say in verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Why do you believe there are so many people deceived? You know, we, we could easily say, yeah, if I see Satan, you know, um, he's not going to get me. Or if I can see this, uh, it won't harm me. That's the thing of it. You can't see Satan. He uses people. Satan uses people. Satan has his own men. As we're meeting here this morning... Satan has his men and his, he's telling them to attack us and attack us and get us away from God any old possible way that you, that you can. That's what Satan wants. You're going to be attacked whether you like it or not. And Satan's going to try to get you away from God. And one of the ways he does that is through false teachers. What's a false teacher? Well, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, Matthew chapter 7 says. Okay, we're not so such afraid of sheep, are we? Because we know uh, we get cotton from them and uh, lamb chops from them. And they're not really smart animals because, you know, the, how the shepherd has to direct them. And we know that they're not really uh, harmful to do physical things to you. But on the other hand, a wolf is, don't it? You know, we, we, if we're going out into the mountains, one thing you want to take with us is, is, is a gun, right? Because if you run into any wolves, it may be necessary to shoot. But if you didn't have anything to protect yourself, you may become a meal for a wolf, okay? Or you may get a bit bad enough to where you bleed to death and die. So we need to think about those things. False prophets, apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. In other words, they put on a show and act like the apostles of Christ and say some of the things that the apostles of Christ would say. Okay? Yeah, they'll say some truth, just like the devil would. Enough to get you hooked. Enough to get you hooked. And then he's got you. And that's what these men were doing. They were transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. And sometimes we don't even know it. Well, that's the purpose that he does that for, to trick, for trickery. And he even has ministers of righteousness. He has ministers Okay, you can go uh, every block and find a church building and a sign out there and has minister this, minister that, minister this, minister that. Well, I'm not a minister, okay? We're all ministers. Minister means servant. We're all servants. I'm not the minister. I'm an evangelist. Satan has ministers of righteousness. And you can go to these denominational churches and there's good people in every one of them, okay? There's fine people in every one of them. And that preacher might even be a fine man or a woman. Okay? You know, they might go out and help people with their monies or give a, give a, a stranger a ride or 
go help a family out that don't have milk for the baby or something of that nature. But that doesn't mean that they're God's people. They don't mean, that, doesn't, that means it could very well be Satan's people. And we go uh, see all these denominational churches around. And they got ministers in the pulpit. The Bible says that they, uh, th therefore, is no great thing if his ministers also transformed as ministers of righteousness. They appear to be righteous. Carry a Bible, say a prayer, preach a little bit, may do, may do some religious things out in the community. And he's the best person you've ever seen. A lot of them like that. But what do they teach and preach? You see, a wolf will not just jump right up on you to scare you away. He wants you for dinner. If he scares you away, he ain't going to have you. That kind of sneak up on you. And that's the way these ministers of righteousness does. They'll tell enough truth to get to you to hear enough that you like what you're hearing. And you hear it enough and you begin to believe it. You begin to believe it. And then one day, he preaches totally off the Bible. Like, you heard the gospel and you want to be a Christian. And so you come forth. And he says, ask Jesus to come in your heart. Say the sinner's prayer. Just believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Say harmless words like that. And they don't sound like bad words, do they? <laughs> By no means do them sound like bad words. But Satan uses them to deceive. There are countless of people sitting on, in denominational churches who have done just that. Come forward and ask Jesus to come to their heart. I believe and that's good enough. And they're going to live their days out until they die or Jesus comes back just to stand before him and hear the words, Depart from me, for I never knew you. Matthew chapter 7, uh, seven the Bible says that <clears throat> no one's going to go to heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And I'm telling you, it's in the Bible that where we find salvation and not from some man. And Paul was dealing with these ministers of righteousness. And he was trying to stop them from teaching and preaching. And he wanted the Corinthian church to know the truth. So that when someone like that was preaching and teaching, they could catch it. What about you this morning? If you hear preaching and teaching this morning, and there was a lie in it, could you catch it? Because of how much you know the word of God. Did you catch me this morning telling a lie? How you know how I haven't? Do you know the Word of God enough to know that I haven't told you a lie this morning? What about Ed Bowsman, Mike Bridenball, any of them? Do you know the Word of God enough and when they preach and teach that they haven't told you something false? Have you caught it? That's what Jesus was talking about. That's what the Apostle Paul's talking about. You see, we must want the spiritual food, the Word of God. You would not go a day without eating unless there was something that was abnormal, physical food. Why would you go a day without eating spiritual food? You have a physical life that you take care of every day, right? What about your spiritual life? Do you take care of it every day? Go without your physical food for a day then you'll find out how you're treating your spiritual life when you go without spiritual food for a day. Hope that helped you out this morning. This morning, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sins. Repentance is a change of mind and conduct toward the way that you're living, and you turn towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have your sins washed away, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not to help you speak in tongues and do miracles,
but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word unto the end. If you are a Christian this morning, and for the time you've been here this morning, God's been nodding at your heart. The Holy Spirit's been nodding at your heart. The Word's been pricking your heart because maybe you're not studying the Word of God the way you should. Well, that's sin, my friend. The Bible tells us to study. And if we don't do what that says, that's disobedience to God. That's sin. And we need to repent. We need to repent of that sin. The Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, If we'll confess our sins to Jesus, He is just and He's faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in His arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior.